Here's an early prototype of signal and points interlocking using a £3.90 Raspberry Pi Pico. I'll demonstrate it and explain how I got it working. Hello, welcome to Endor Model Railway. I'm Jonathan. I'll start by showing you what this interlocking does so far, how I've implemented it and how I intend to enhance it. I've used this crossover section of my layout as the case study. When this signal is clear, allowing trains to run along the line in this direction, it would be unsafe to allow these left-hand points to be set to their left route, which is on the right as we look at it. The points must remain in their ahead route. To change the points to the left, the signal first has to be set at danger to stop any trains coming along the main line. Once at danger, the points can be changed to go left. I decided this could be expressed as two rules. One, if the signal is clear, then the points are locked to their ahead route. Two, if the points are set to their left route, then the signal is locked at danger. My prototype set up here has a green LED on the left to represent the signal at clear, and a red LED on the right to represent the signal at danger. This switch is used to set the signal to danger or clear, and this switch is used to set the points to ahead or left. There's no physical representation of the points, they're only represented in software. When the program starts, I've written it to set the signal to danger, then to clear. On the computer, I've got the program displaying information about inputs and what it thinks the state of the signal and points are. It's programmed to think the points are set to a head to start off with. While the signal is clear, if I try to set the points to go left, the interlocking says that they're locked at a head. The state stays as it was before. If I first set the signal to danger and then try to change the points again, this time it allows it and changes the virtual points. Next, I try to change the signal to clear, but that's not allowed. With the points going left, the signal is locked at danger. Changing the points to ahead allows the signal to then be changed to clear. The way I set up the rules looks like this for the signal and points, where I say if one thing is in a particular state, then it locks another thing into a particular state. I've got general programming experience, but this is my first foray into controlling anything physical, or dealing with input from anything other than a keyboard or mouse. Over the preceding weeks I'd been watching videos showing how other people had used Arduinos for signal control, block detection, or point motor control. When I looked at buying an Arduino, I was surprised that they weren't as cheap as I'd assumed. An Arduino Nano is about £20, but I found that a Raspberry Pi Pico has similar capabilities for £3.90, there were plenty of videos on YouTube about the Pico 2, so I watched a few of those and decided to try one out. Step 1 of the adventure, make a cup of tea. I downloaded the recommended Python development environment, Thonny, onto my laptop. I can't remember if I actually used it with the Pico or not. I definitely started to write MicroPython code in it, but I found that Thonny lacked helpful features. Instead, I found and followed a guide to get a development environment called Visual Studio Code working with a Raspberry Pi Pico. I already had both Python and Visual Studio Code set up on my laptop, so it was fairly straightforward. I actually first tried to get it working from Windows Subsystem for Linux, but that failed for a reason I couldn't fathom, and I couldn't find anything useful from some googling, so I gave up on that approach quite quickly. Whether it was first from Thonny or Visual Studio Code, I can't remember which, I was very excited to get an example program running on the Pico. It's example code that I copy and pasted from somewhere, and it just blinks a built-in LED on the Pico. This was a promising start. Having established that everything needed to control the Pico was in place and working, I actually started a separate Python programming project to develop the interlocking code. The logic isn't directly reliant on how inputs are given, so developing it directly on the laptop and not needing the Pico plugged in made things a little easier for me. I'll give an overview of what I came up with, but I'm not intending for this to be a Python programming tutorial. It might, to start with, seem more complicated than it needs to be for what I've just shown it doing, but my goal is to be able to easily extend its use to more signals and points, with lots more interlocking rules. Both signals and points will need to be lockable by the interlocking, so I created a type called lockable that has properties and functions that both signals and points will have in common. This allows other code later on to deal with either signals or points in the same way without needing to know specifically which type of thing it's dealing with. From that, I made a signal type and a points type with features that are specific to those types of things. 
At this stage, that didn't amount to much, but I have since extended them. I made a concept of an interlocking rule. Its job is to remember the details of a rule, such as if object X is in state A, then object Y is locked in state B, and to determine whether or not that particular rule is currently in effect. Then there's the main interlocking code. This bit has some features that make it easy for me to add new rules. It stores all of the rules that I'll define, and controls whether or not a thing is allowed to have its state set to a particular value. For that last part, it finds all of the interlocking rules that could apply to that thing, and checks to see if any of them are in effect, to decide whether or not the state is allowed to change. When I was developing this code, I created two virtual signals to test it. The extra one is a shunt signal that gives permission, or not, for a train to reverse over the crossing. I defined the interlocking rules, and then a series of commands to change the state of the points and signals, exercising various scenarios. The program produced text output that I then analysed to make sure that everything was as it should be, and I was happy with how things were working. It's worth noting that this program is not comprehensive. For example, it doesn't stop me from defining rules that contradict each other, or which can result in a situation where the things are locked in a state that I can't get them back out of. I have to be careful about the rules that I define. If this proves to be a problem, then I can always come back and enhance the program. If it gets much more complex, I'll also need to add some automated tests for it. The next step was to interface with the physical world. I ordered a cheap pack of LEDs of various colours. It worked out at less than two pence per LED, but it didn't come with any information whatsoever. Someone had left a review with some information, but I don't know where they got it from. Based on other LEDs that I've had in the past, I decided to assume that each LED would take roughly two volts and be able to withstand 20 to 30 milliamps. The Pico's general input-output pins deliver 3.3 volts. That leaves 1.3 volts to deal with, so rearranging V equals IR for resistance, that's R equals V divided by I. With a target current of 20 milliamps, that's 1.3 divided by 0.02, which is 65 ohms. I had resistors of 100 ohms, so I used one of those. Usually the longer arm of an LED is the positive one, but how does that relate to the Pi Pico? There's a lot of talk of ground pins on the Pico. I don't really know what that means. The Pico could be powered by a battery and so not be connected to the ground at all. I think it just means low or no voltage. In terms of the LEDs, that means the negative side needs to connect to the Pico's ground pins. In the MicroPython code, the LEDs are controlled by making a pin with the GPIO pin number that the LED is connected to, and a parameter to tell the Pico that this pin is for output as opposed to input. I updated my signal code to take the pin numbers that the red and green LEDs are connected to, and to switch them on or off depending on the state that the signal is put into. Connecting switches for input is more complicated. I connected mine to a ground pin, so when I push the switch and it closes the circuit, apparently that means the pin goes into a low state. That being the case, the pin should be in a high state when the switch isn't being pressed, so I have to tell the Pico to set a pull-up resistor to do that. If I had the switches connected to the 3.3 volt output of the Pico, rather than ground, then the logic would be the opposite and I'd need a pull-down resistor, and the pin would go to a high state when the switch is pressed. I don't fully grasp what's really going on here, but this is the way it needs to be, and it seems to be a common thing that's not specific to the Pico. Both switches that I'm using are three position on-off-on switches. The silver one is a momentary contact, which springs back to off. The black one is a toggle that stays where it's put. As far as the Pico is concerned, there are four distinct inputs connected. I added some code to run indefinitely that keeps checking to see if any of the inputs have been activated. This is in a rough and ready state at the moment, I'll refine it another time. With switches, there's a thing called bouncing. When the switch is operated, the connection from it can briefly fluctuate for a bit, causing the input value to bounce between low and high. Debouncing is about dealing with that. You keep an eye on the value for a bit, and if it doesn't bounce around, then you can be confident that it's settled. At the moment, I don't really need to worry about debouncing. Most of the time, the physical switches are going to be in their off position, and when they're switched, they trigger a fixed action. It doesn't really matter if there's some signal fluctuation for a bit. If a change got detected at all, then it means it's time to trigger the action. What could happen without debouncing is that it might appear, for example, that I try to set a signal to a particular state 10 times in a row very quickly. 
This didn't happen in my examples because there's a two second pause in the program after each time it tries to set a state, and a short pause after it displays the current state of the system, and at the end of each iteration of the infinite loop where it checks for input. These pauses are acting as a primitive mitigation for bouncing. I've been keeping in mind how this will have to interface with what I've got on the railway. Unlike mechanical interlocking in a signal box, I'm not going to have any mechanism that will physically stop a switch or lever from being moved. Maybe in the distant future, but not any time soon. That means I need to have momentary switches which will tell the Pico what I'd like to happen, and then the Pico will have to be the thing that makes that happen, if the interlocking allows. I intend to move semaphore signals with servo motors, so for those the Pico will need to control the servos. The points are a little more tricky. They're switched by solenoid motors, which are controlled via a momentary connection to a capacitor discharge unit. The punch of power that comes through is way higher than what the Pico can deliver or handle, so I'll need to control them via relays, but I haven't looked yet at exactly which ones, and I'll need to be careful about how much current is used. I ordered some servo motors to experiment with. I've done a small amount of control with them, but haven't got very far yet. Endor isn't actually at a state yet where I can be putting signals in place, but I'd like to use the existing microswitches that are connected to the point switching rods to determine what position the points are in at any time. That will inform the interlocking so that it can apply the appropriate logic. That will mean adding extra relays, and now seems like a good time to be getting those in place, before I completely cover that area in scenery. For the Dawlish T wall layout, I'm not intending to have any points in the track plan, but I'd like to have automatic signals if I can. At the moment, I'm aiming for two aspect LED signals, with some kind of block detection to set them to red as a train passes, and I think I'll probably be able to control all of that with one Raspberry Pi Pico. So far, I've found it really fun getting this element of the railway started. That's all for now. Bye bye.